So eight out of ten units. So we have three more units of material, three more tests of new material, and then we start reviewing for the AP exam. That's it. It's crazy. Okay, then after we take the AP exam, things slow down in here. So this unit is all kind of one-off lessons that use the fundamental theorem of calculus and talk about like how you can apply areas under curves to different situations. And the book doesn't do a very good job of these types of questions, so you'll get worksheets for your homeworks mostly. Okay? But the AP test asks lots of questions about these lessons, which is why we're definitely teaching you guys it, and which is why we are start, starting to get more into free response style questions and your review, instead of being a packet of practice materials, is going to be a packet of free response questions that you need to know how to do for the test. Okay? And we will do examples of types of free response questions that you'll see today. Okay? So, applying the fundamental theorem of calculus is the name for this lecture. And it's going to start out with just differential equations that we know how to do, we know how to solve, just with one more step. So just a reminder, a differential equation is just an equation that has a derivative. Plus, we usually see some initial conditions. And then when I ask you to solve a differential equation, what do, I, what do you do? Yes. To solve a differential equation, you find an equation. You find the original f. That satisfies your initial conditions and your derivatives. So, this is an example of a differential equation, really, just with a one extra step. So let's maybe take this one step at a time. I'm going to erase this to start, but it's going to come back. So if you already wrote it down, don't worry about it. I could ask you to solve the differential equation given f of 1 is 3 and f prime is equal to 4x plus 2. And you could find f that satisfies those conditions. So ready, set, go and do that. All right, so we solved the differential equation. Well, now today there's going to be one extra part. The extra part will be oops, that to find f of 4, given f of 1 is 3 and f prime is equal to 4x plus 2. Were you here the entire time or did you just get here? I got here like halfway through. I didn't get that. You didn't get this. Oh, but you know, yeah, I did. You did see this. Yeah, but then you went to the bathroom. bathroom. All right. yeah.
Okay, so the only extra step you need to do is plug in 4 into your F and you get it. F of 4 is equal to 16 times 2, 32, plus 8 minus 1, F of 4 is 39. Not bad. All right, let's do one more, and then we'll move on. Let's do this one. So it's f prime of x is equal to 6 root x, f of 4 is 3, find f of 9. Questions? Okay, what you just did for those two examples back to back is you used the antiderivative method, the find C method for solving this situation where you're trying to find a future value. So if you want to write that, you know, next to them and the column next to them. Those two examples, you just did the antiderivative method or the find C method.
Well, let's try a third one. Here we go. Find f of 6 given, let's change this from f of 1 is 1. f of 1 is equal to uh, 5. 5. Yep. And f prime is equal to x squared e to the x. I'm going to change it. All right, figure that one out. All right, what happens? Can't take the antiderivative of x squared e dx. You guys don't know how to. You don't know the antiderivative product rule. If you take the A-B test, you won't ever know how to take the antiderivative of this. If you take the B-C test, you will have to learn how to take the antiderivative of this. But right now, we're just kind of like, ugh. Well, let's pause. And I'll tell you right now that you can be able to figure this out using a different method, okay? Instead of a find C antiderivative method, there is a different method of finding what this F of 6 is, given F of 1 is 5 and given that derivative, okay? And the key is you need your calculator, okay? So let's have our calculators out. We will learn right now how to find areas under functions using a calculator. So let's start with just a quick example, something that we could do without our calculator, the area under x squared between 0 and 4. There's only one way you guys know of to do this as of right now. And what's that method? The thing with the line, right, Mr. Magnella? Yeah. What do you have to do before you take the use the line? Antiderivative, okay? The area is equal to the change in the antiderivative. Sure. Well, your calculator can find this a different way. Your calculator doesn't know how to take antiderivatives. You can't plug something in and it'll tell you that the antiderivative of x squared is one-third x cubed. But your calculator can find areas under curves. What they do is they just use a Riemann sum. They say, okay, between 0 and 4, we're going to split it into really, really, really tiny intervals. We'll take function values as heights of rectangles. We'll sum up all of those heights, and they'll have such a great approximation because they've taken so many really, really skinny rectangles that they'll tell you that's the area. Okay? So we can tell your calculator, do that really, really huge Riemann sum. And to tell your calculator to do that, you're going to introduce yourself to Math 9. So math 9, you see F-N-I-N-T. Well, for some of you, the integral will just show up. And you can plug in your x's. You can plug in your interval. You can make sure it says dx, and you'd get the answer. For some of you, and raise your hands if this is the case, F-N-I-N-T will show up. Okay, good. So you have an older operating system on your calculator you need to do the following. And this is something that you'd probably write down if you're going to be using your calculator. F and I and T, so you're going to take the integral of your function you're going to put a comma 
to say with respect to x, so that's kind of like the dx part, and then you'll put another comma and you will tell your calculator when to start or where to start your integral. So in this case it's zero, but in general it's a. And then you'll do another uh, comma and you'll say where your interval ends at b. Okay, so no matter what version you have, we should be getting the same answer. x squared with respect to x from a to b. Okay, 21 and a third, or 64 thirds, that's the area which we would find is the exact same value as if we took the antiderivative of this and found the change in the antiderivative between 0 and 4. Cool. Well, between 1 and 6. Yeah, I guess we'll keep it. Well, guess what? Now I could actually find something that I couldn't take the antiderivative of. I could find the area from 1 to 6 of x squared e to the x. Something I couldn't do using the fundamental theorem of calculus because I don't know the antiderivative of x squared e to the x. I can do now with my calculator. So figure out what that guy is. Notice your calculator takes some time to do that calculation. You can plug in some integrals with large intervals and it'll take your calculator a very solid amount of time in for like a calculator, definitely, to sum up all these infinitely skinny rectangles. Uh, but for this guy, it's not too long. Math 9, Fn, int, x squared, e to the x, with respect to x from 1 to 6. And I get 1,0486.43. Okay, big number, but that's the area under this, you know, really fast-growing function between 1 and 6. Well, I could actually use that knowledge to figure out this answer, this question. I could figure out what f of 6 is. Given f of 1 is 5, and that f prime is x squared e to the x. And the connection is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Some differential equations seem impossible to solve for, or some future values seem impossible to solve for if we don't know how to find the antiderivative. But the fundamental theorem of calculus can help find future function values like an f of b given some initial function value and the change in your function between A and B. <clears throat> okay. 
Well, the key is this last little part, the change in f of x between a and b, that can be written as the area under f prime. So let's write down the fundamental theorem of calculus and just see how that works. Fundamental theorem of calculus states that the area under a derivative is equal to the change in its antiderivative. Well, we can flip-flop and we can say that, okay, this means that's the change in my function. And since I know this is my change in my function, I can use this equation to help me find some missing f of b. Who can tell me how? How can I find f of 6 given f of 1 is 5 and f prime is x squared e to the x? Once I know the area, which I did know, right, 1, 0, 4, whatever it was, 1, 4, 8, 6, and what else do I know? F of 1 is 5. I can use this to help me find F of B. Simply add f of a to both sides. And we develop this application fundamental theorem of calculus formula that states that a future function value that we don't know is equal to an initial function value that we do know plus the change in my function, which is the area under f prime from a to b. So an unknown is equal to an initial or a known plus the change, which is the same as area under F prime. Change of F, area under F prime. Okay, so now we can figure out what F of 6 is without having to know the antiderivative, but with having a calculator handy, ready to use. It is just f of 1 plus the area from 1 to 6 under x squared e to the x, dx, or it is just 5 plus 1, 0, 4, 8, 6. Here's my answer. So we just kind of discovered the fundamental theorem of calculus method to kind of solving these differential equations and finding these future values. So we have the antiderivative find C method, which can be used if you don't have your calculator. And you could actually use the fundamental theorem of calculus method for things if you don't have your calculator, as long as you can take the antiderivative, but it's usually unnecessary. Unnecessary. And then uh, now we have this other method, this FTC method of finding a future value. So let's go back to those first two examples. Here's the first example written again. So F find F of 4 given F of 1 is 3 and F prime is equal to 4X plus 2. Why don't you solve this using your calculator and using the fundamental theorem of calculus? 
and confirm that the first answer you got is the correct answer. So I already know that my answer should be 39. Let's make sure that the answer of 39 is correct. On your calculator, we should see 39 after we've done our calculations. Remember, it's math 9. Math 9 pulls up your new integral. And remember, an unknown value is equal to a known value plus the change. Or a future value is equal to an initial plus the change between your initial and your future. f of b is equal to f of a plus the change. It all comes from the fundamental theorem of calculus. Change comes from the area under f prime. That's the beautiful thing about the fundamental theorem of calculus. Make sure you type in this stuff into your calculator, and we are getting 39. Future is equal to an initial plus a change. It's not a change in a rate. It's not a change in a derivative. It's an overall change, a future minus an initial. All right, let's do the second example. You already did the find C method. Let's use the calculator method. This is a quick one to do. You have your calculator handy. Figure out that f of 9 has to be equal to 79 using your calculator, using the second fundamental theorem of calculus application method. Any questions, any difficulties we're having with our calculators? Make sure your interval is correct. If I know f of 4, this is my initial value. That 4 is the a. I'm trying to find f of 9. That 9 would be the b. Okay? The intervals will change frequently. You could use either method. for a question like this. But I guarantee you, whether this is a calculator or a non-calculator question, that would probably dictate which method you would use. So if I told you this was a
calculator question, I could probably guess which method you would probably choose to use, right? The one where you plug things into your calculator and do minimal amount of math. So figure that out. I'm giving you the velocity. I want you to find a position. Well, the derivative of position is velocity, or the area under velocity would be the change in your position. Answer is not a negative number. What do we get? You get like nine or something? Six? At nine? Six? Six? I think six might be right. Six is right. Don't forget that initial value. This situation, I'd say my position at 2 pi over 3 was equal to my position at time 0 plus the change in my position, which would be the area under my velocity curve. This actually you can you can use the fundamental theorem of calculus here to find this. You know the antiderivative of six sine t is negative six cos t. You do between find the change between zero and two pi over three. You know that can be done. Just if you were going to find the antiderivative, you might as well have done it from the beginning to find your actual position function by finding the plus c, this would have been negative 6 cos t plus c. Once you find that c using your initial value, you could have just plugged in 2 pi over 3, and you would have gotten the same answer. But if you have your calculator, you can just do this, and you get 9. Okay? Well, One more simple one, then we'll go into more difficult ones.
At f of five. Okay. AP question. This is similar to an AP question asked, I think, like five years ago. There'll be multiple parts. This, this is part one, part two. So a plant receives coal at a rate of G of T is equal to 90 plus 45 cosine of T squared over 18 tons G of T per hour T. The plant opens the day with 500 tons of coal and works an eight-hour workday. How many tons will the plant finish with at the end of the day? Part one is if no coal is processed during the day, and part two is if 100 tons of coal is processed per hour. Now, you're probably already plugging in your integrals, you're probably already doing anything, but is this question as simple as just figuring out what g of h is? If I'm receiving coal at a rate of this, can I just plug in 8 and that will be the total amount of coal that I've received? Is this my answer to part 1? Okay, maybe this plus 500. That's still not, but I'm receiving coal at a rate. If I just plug in a value, that's how much coal I've received, right? No. Hmm. This is where these AP style questions get really, really tricky. And you have to really, really understand what you have. G of 8 does not give you total coal received after eight hours. What does G of eight stand for? What does it mean? What does it tell me if I plug in eight into that function? The rate at which I'm receiving coal. What does that what does that mean, the rate at which I'm receiving coal? Ah, beautiful. It is how much coal I'm receiving at this specific moment in time. It is a rate of change. It can be considered a derivative. This is where people kind of get tripped up, but especially if you saw this question not during this lesson. This is like the derivative of your total amount of coal or of your like population of coal. So G of 8 is not total coal received. It is the rate that coal is being received at that moment not over an hour, not over eight hours, just right when T equals eight at the eighth hour on the watch, it like strikes eight o'clock. That's how much coal is being received per hour. So 
So what you have to do is you have to say, well, if this is the derivative, the antiderivative of this G, you can't make it another capital G because it's already capital G. You kind of have to think of something else like P or C or something. This function, which we don't know because you can't take the antiderivative of this, this is the total amount of coal. So the question is, how much do we finish with at the end of the day? You're trying to find P of 8. Well, that's equal to your initial amount plus the change in your total amount, which will be the area under your derivative or the change in P, which is the area under G. Now, maybe you just plugged numbers in and you did this already, but moving forward, once I give you different information and more information about different units, it's going to be tough to come back to this and understand what's given us. And you'll find that as we move forward. Okay, so figure out the answer to this. We should be getting 1325. is the answer to part one. Now part two, figure out how much coal is in the plant at the end of the day if 100 tons of coal is being processed per hour. So that means we're receiving coal, we're processing it, we're sending it out. So Refining it, doing something to it before we send it out on a train. What do I have to do to get part two? Anybody? Yeah, subtract the area under the processing graph, which is just a straight line, 100 tons processed per hour. You would just subtract 800. That's the amount of coal going out. So for part two, you would just take 1325 and subtract the 800 going out which is 100 tons per hour for eight hours, which is 525. This is in tons, tons. Okay, not that bad. Let's do a, another one, not really related to this, but it'll be a multi-step one, right? Here we go. From 0 to 6, a particle is mo moving along the x-axis. The particle's position, x of t, is not given to us. Uh, the velocity is, and the acceleration is, and the initial position is. The question is, between 0 and 6, the particle is going to change direction exactly once. The question is, what is the position of the particle at that time when that particle changes direction? There you go.
I'll give you the answer as well, so you know what you're looking for. Fourteen point one three five. See if you can have this pop up in your calculator. Particle changes direction exactly once. You don't know when it is. You can't assume it's when t equals 6. You need to figure out when the particle is changing direction. That's the first step. The second step would be to find the position at that time. If you don't know what the time is, when the particle changes direction, you can't figure out the answer. Who can figure it out? Nobody yet. It's exactly 14.135. If you're close to it, no, doesn't count. What happens when a particle changes direction? Can anybody tell me? Ms. Highland? Velocity is zero, yes, but you could have a positive velocity and then you hit zero and then you go back to positive velocity, so you don't necessarily change directions then. But what would you have to do? Your velocity would have to be zero and Velocity is going to have to change signs. Step one, you guys got to figure out when velocity changes signs. Or figure out when it's equal to zero, but you have to then make sure it changes sign then. So either I'm solving this equation by hand, Or what am I doing? To solve that equation. Mr. Beard. Graph it. Graph it. 
Ah, uh, that's step one. Figure out what t is when v of t changes sign. Graph the left, graph the right, see when they equal each other, and make sure they change the sign. Right. Good job. Then you need to find the position of your particle at that moment. Y equals graph Y equals zero two. Okay. Now on the X axis there's a line there. You can go to second calc intersect. You can go over to the intersection you're looking for and then just press enter until they tell you the intersection. Uh, yes, rounded to the third decimal place. Scroll over to the specific one you're looking for, and then uh, they'll give you the right one. The initial position? Oh, yes. Remember? Initial plus the change. No, oh, that X value is wrong. 1.8. To solve this and to find the solution between 0 and 6, I graph the left and the right side. I also change my window so that I know I'm just looking at this one right there. I can see my velocity is going to positive from negative, positive to negative, and I calculate my intersect. Now, it helps if your cursor is over the intersection you're looking for. Just makes it easier to find. And then you figure out what your time is. So T is five one nine five five two two three. Nine five five two two three. Okay. So now you're trying to find the position at that time. You need to find X at that um, T. We'll call this, uh, you know, TF. 
that's equal to your initial position that you're given, don't forget x of 0, plus the change in your position, which you can calculate by finding the area under your velocity curve from 0 to that final time. And you would get 14.135. Why do you have E just to E to the X? I was going to find um, where it was like, where that was equal to, um, like, you know, like the pi value that would make that sign come out to like negative 0.5. It would be 2 times negative 0.5 and then plus 20 to 0. That would be the position where, but I messed up. But I was just tired that I put, I thought this was going to be equal to negative. Uh, one half. Okay. Yeah. So sine's equal to negative one half at where? Oh no, no sine's equal. No, no, this, this sine alone is not equal to negative. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I messed up where it was. So it should be seven. What is it? Seven pi over six. Yep. And yeah, eleven pi over six. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that's like that's making it too complicated, right? You could just set that. Entire equation equal to zero, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, just plugged it in. Yeah. But that, I mean, that, that would have worked. Yeah. I don't know. All right. Do we all get it? We all get this one. That's a tough one. Nothing. Acceleration has nothing to do with this part of the problem, Miss Bush. But you know what? They're going to give you lots of stuff that's going to deal with nothing. Maybe acceleration is dealing with something somewhere in another part of this problem, but not here. Could you find the minimum on the acceleration graph? Yeah, the minimum of acceleration would be when your velocity would change directions. Sure, you could do that. Yes, yes. Or would it be a maximum? I don't know if it, it actually would have anything to do with it. No, I don't think it would. Go find the minimum of the acceleration. I don't think it would be... Yeah, no. I don't think they have anything to do with each other. That would be when, like, the change in your acceleration is zero, which, which is not related to when your position changes. It's, I know, it's crazy, but no. Acceleration has nothing to do with this problem. Let's go and do this problem. This data should look familiar to you. You already did a part of this free response question from a past AP exam. This is another part of that same free response question from that same AP exam. Okay, I'll let you read the question and let you do it yourself. The answer is exactly 73.043. Well, with some rounding in there.
see if you can get it. If you get close to it, doesn't count. It's gotta be exact. So if you get like 74 or something, or 72 something, nope. Everybody forgets that a future value is not just equal to the change. It's equal to the change plus your whatever your initial value is. Don't think of it as an initial value. Think of it as a known value. An unknown value is equal to a known value plus the change from the unknown to the known or the known to the unknown. Good. plus your known value. Never. They make sure they're so tough that you can't take the antiderivative and find W of T so that you can just plug in W of 25. Most people, if they make mistakes on this, it's because they use 0 0.55, which is the initial temperature, sure. But for this situation, this function, W prime, only works from 20 to 25. So you would actually be using this value, this known value, W of 20 is equal to 71. So W of 25 would equal W of 20 plus the change from 20 to 25 of W prime. All right, your homework is a worksheet. I will pass it out to you right now.